Good day and welcome to the Poplar Inc. Q4 2019 Earnings Conference call and webcast. All participants will be in listen-only mode. If you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note the events being recorded. I'd now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Paul Cardillo, Investor Relations Officer of Popular Inc. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on today's call. With us today is our CEO, Ignacio Alvarez, our CFO, Carlos Vasquez, and our CRO, Lidio Soriano. They will review our results for the full year and fourth quarter, and then answer your questions. Other members of our management team will also be available during the Q&A session. Before we start, I would like to remind you that on today's call, we may make forward-looking statements that are based on management's current expectations and are subject to risks and uncertainties. Factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from these forward-looking statements are set forth within today's earnings press release and are detailed in our SEC filings. You may find today's press release and our SEC filings on our webpage at popular.com. I will now turn the call over to our CEO, Ignacio Alvarez. Good morning, and thank you for joining the call. Today's results reflect another solid quarter and an outstanding year in which we achieved record core earnings. Before I discuss the highlights for 2019, I am very pleased to report that in January, we announced a series of planned capital actions that we intend to execute this year. These actions include an increase in the company's quarterly common stock dividend from 30 to 40 cents per share, beginning in the second quarter of 2020, and a common stock repurchase program of up to $500 million. We also announced the redemption of our 8.25 Series B preferred stock, of which $28 million is currently outstanding. Additionally, on December 31, 2019, we acquired a $74 million credit card portfolio in Puerto Rico. In a separate transaction, we also acquired the rights to issue credit cards under the JetBlue co-branded loyalty program in Puerto Rico. And we plan to launch this new product in the second half of 2020. These actions evidence the strength of our capital position, which allows us to return capital to our shareholders while we continue to invest in our franchise. We turn to slide three. We reported core earnings for the full year, for the full year our annual net income of $671 million reflects an increase of 38% from our 2018 adjusted net income of $487 million. 2019 results benefit from strong deposit and loan growth in both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Credit quality metrics continue to be positive in 2019. In Puerto Rico, most indicators were better than or close to pre-hurricane levels. In the U.S., Credit quality was solid throughout the year and reduced our exposure to the taxi medallion market to $19 million. Our capital levels are strong, with year-end Tier 1 capital and Tier 1 common ratios at 17.8%. Our tangible book value ended 2019 at $55.10, a 17% increase year over year. In Puerto Rico, we grew loans by 1.5%, increased our deposits by 10%, and our net interest margin was 4.3%. In our U.S. operation, we grew loans and our deposits each by 9%, and our net interest margin was 3.32%. Please turn to slide four. Our reported core net income of $167 million which included an $18 million tax benefit, was slightly higher than the previous quarter and $33 million, or 24% higher than the adjusted net income for the fourth quarter of 2018. Fourth quarter results were driven by lower taxes and higher net non-interest income, partially offset by lower net interest income, higher provision, and higher expenses. Net interest income was lower compared to the previous quarter. The fourth quarter was the first quarter to reflect the cumulative impact of the three 
recent interest rate cut. As such, the lower yields in our loan and investment portfolios were only partially offset by increases in investment and money market balances. Credit quality results continue to show favorable trends. The credit metrics of our BPPR operations reflected lower non-performing loans, lower NPL inflows, and stable net charge-offs. The increase in net charge-offs in the U.S. operations was related to the taxi medallion portfolio, which has now been largely resolved. Please turn to slide five for an update on the environment in Puerto Rico. Economic activity stabilized in 2019 after a post-hurricane rebound in 2018. This occurred despite the macro and political uncertainty that persisted throughout the year and has continued into early 2020. With respect to migration trends, the most recently released passenger data from the San Juan Airport reflects that the net number of people who left the island through September was approximately 55,000. Excluding 2018, which was substantially impacted by the inflow of people coming back to Puerto Rico following the hurricanes, the data for 2019 reflects a favorable variance compared to the same period in 2015, 16, and 17, which averaged outflows of 109,000 people. We will need to see whether the recent seismic activity in the South will have an impact on this trend. Additionally, the U.S. Census Bureau recently, recently estimated that as of July 2019, the population of Puerto Rico remained flat versus 2018. This compares favorable to the, to the 1.7 average annual decline in the population since 2010. Employment trends remain stable throughout the year. In December, total employment, which includes self-employed individuals, was down 1.4% versus December 2018. The unemployment rate was 8.4% in December, which is consistent with levels seen earlier in 2019. Salary employment was flat year over year, with both private and public employment essentially unchanged compared to the same period last year. The auto industry continued to perform well in 2019. 106,000 new units were sold, down 1% compared to 2018, but up 27% and 24% versus 2017 and 2016. Cement sales were down 6% in 2019 when compared to 2018. Though there was considerable surge in activity in early 2018 following the hurricanes, 2019 sales were 31% and 17% higher than in 2017 and 16. The dollar value of our customers' debit and credit card transactions in the fourth quarter grew by 6% compared to the third quarter and by 2% versus the same period in 2018. Our consumer loan origination trends in Puerto Rico have also remained solid, especially in the auto and personal loan segments. Our mortgage originations, while still at historically low levels, were 7% higher than the previous quarter, driven primarily by higher home purchase activity. On the commercial loan side, balances increase sequentially. We continue to expect that incremental lending opportunities will be tied to the performance of the local economy and ongoing recovery efforts. Popular's customers in Puerto Rico grew by 8,400 this quarter and have increased by 45,000 since December 2018. As we have commented before, the sustainability and pace of further progress in the Puerto Rico economy will be heavily dependent on the magnitude and timing of federal recovery funds flowing into the island. The disbursement of the funds has been slower than many had hoped. This delay is related to concerns regarding the appropriate oversight 
of the disbursements of federal funds. Recently, HUD authorized the use of $8.5 billion of CDBG DR funds subject to strict oversight requirements in addition to the $1.5 billion previously released. While this is definitely positive, recent controversy relating to the distribution of emergency supplies may increase concern over local oversight. It is difficult to, pre difficult to predict whether this ultimately will impact the amount and timing of recovery funds received. However, we continue to believe that these funds will be significant and have a positive impact on the economy. I will now offer a brief update on matters related to the, to the seismic events that have impacted the southwestern part of the island, including a magnitude 6.4 earthquake on January 7th. I want to emphasize that this event does not compare to the widespread destruction and damage caused by Hurricane Maria. The damage is mostly concentrated in 60 municipalities, which, with the exception of Ponce, are relatively small. Fortunately, none of our employees suffered physical harm and our facilities are in sound condition. Unlike Maria, telecommunications were unaffected and power was restored within days. We resumed operations on the day following the earthquake and have provided uninterrupted service since. All but three of our 164 branches in Puerto Rico are operating normally. We are in constant communication with our employees and working closely with our customers to help them with their specific needs. While the impact on our operations was limited, many of the residents in the South suffered significant damages to their homes, public schools remain closed, and the ensuing aftershocks have made it extremely difficult for people in the region to regain a sense of normalcy. As we have done in the past, we swiftly responded through our foundation, which has close ties with nonprofit organizations and communities in the South, to bring immediate assistance to those affected areas. A little more than two years ago, Puerto Rico faced and managed through the impact of Hurricane Maria. Although the scale of these events is not comparable to Maria, we remain attentive to the impact it could have in certain sectors of the economy, principally in the hospitality industry. Puerto Ricans are once again demonstrating overwhelming solidarity and support and are facing this situation with the resolve to move forward. We will continue working with them, confident that Puerto Rico will once again demonstrate its spirit and ability to rebuild. I will now turn the call over to Carlos, who will discuss the financial results in greater detail. Thank you, Ignacio. Good morning. Before we turn to fourth quarter results, let me expand on Popular's full year 2019 performance. Our net interest income increased by 9% year over year to $1.9 billion due to solid loan growth, along with robust, though lower, net interest margins. In 2019, our provision expense decreased by approximately 37% to $166 million on the back of improved credit trends. Excluding the FDIC-related benefit in 2018, non-interest income increased by approximately 8% year-over-year, driven by improvements across most, most segments. Operating expenses increased 4% in the year to $1.48 billion. Higher personal costs and professional fees were the primary drivers. Our capital position was robust and ended the year with tangible book value per share increasing by nearly $9 per share to 55.10. And common equity tier one ratio improving by 88 basis points year over year to 17.8%. This improvement was achieved even after the repurchase of $250 million of common stock and an increase in our common stock dividend. As Ignacio mentioned, overall, an outstanding year. Please turn to slide six for fourth quarter results. As usual, additional information is provided in the appendix to the slide deck. Today's earnings press release details variances from the third quarter. 
Net interest income for the quarter was $467 million, down $10 million from the third quarter. The primary driver of this decline was the decrease in rates that occurred during the third and fourth quarters of 2019, which, along with our asset mix, led to a 17 basis points contraction in NIM. This impact was somewhat offset by higher commercial loans in both Puerto Rico and in the U.S., higher auto and personal loans at BPPR, and lower interest expense. This result is consistent with our commentary last quarter that lower interest rates negatively impact our results by four to $5 million per quarter for every 25 basis point drop in rates. Other factors like asset mix and the shape of the yield curve also impact this estimate. We expect our margin to improve from fourth quarter levels as a result of present expectations of stable rates, the gradual reduction in our asset sensitivity, and the eventual normalization of the levels of Puerto Rico government deposits. If government deposit levels exceed our expectations, the margin improvement could be less, but our net income will benefit. As of the end of the fourth quarter, Puerto Rico public deposits were roughly $10.5 billion, which is down from the end of Q3, but consistent with the balances communicated in our last webcast. In 2019, our loan portfolio grew by $907 million, or 3%, despite a runoff of $420 million in our legacy mortgage and Western Bank portfolios. In 2020, we anticipate slight growth in loan balances for Popular. In Puerto Rico, we expect to see growth in most segments, including commercial, auto, and personal loans, despite continued runoff in our legacy mortgage and commercial portfolios. In the U.S., we anticipate commercial lending to be the primary driver of higher loan balances. Our provision in the fourth quarter increased by $10.6 million sequentially. Lidio will expand on this during his credit commentary. Non-interest income increased by $9.7 million in the period. The improvement was due to a $3 million increase in insurance fees driven primarily by higher contingent commissions, which usually happen in Q4. We benefited from a $3 million improvement in mortgage banking results, mainly due to MSR valuation adjustment, and finally, a $4.7 million variable variance in the adjustment to indemnity reserves on previously sold loans. Total operating expenses were $391 million, $14.1 million higher than the prior quarter. Personnel costs increased by $10.6 million in the quarter. These increases were driven by annual incentives and headcount, higher commissions, and incremental investments in employee benefits and training. Professional fees increased by $4.6 million, primarily due to higher expenditures in regulatory, accounting, and technology fees, offsetting part by lower legal fees. Business promotion costs were $4.8 million higher in the fourth quarter, reflecting the traditional seasonality of this expense line. These increases were partially offset by lower other operating expenses by 9.5 million, mainly due to lower operating losses and the non-recurrence of a 2.6 million loss related to an undeveloped corporate site which was placed for sale during the third quarter. Profit sharing expenses were 9.4 million in Q4, and total $28.8 million for the year. If we exclude the 2019 profit-sharing expense, which by definition is not budgeted, our average quarterly expense for the year was $362 million, consistent with our original guidance of $364 million. For 2020, we expect average quarterly expenses to be around $383 million. The increase from 2019 is mostly driven by higher expenses in the following categories. Personnel, as we continue to invest in training and compensation, with the related benefits also increasing. A tight labor market in Puerto Rico and in the areas where we operate in the mainland contributes to this increase. Technology, as we continue to modernize our digital capabilities, cure obsolescence, 
and address regulatory, cyber, and compliance needs. Some of the increased results from the completion of multi-year technology investments that now start to be amortized. And finally, business promotion, especially expenses related to rewards programs for our clients, many linked to our revamped credit card offerings in Puerto Rico and growth in our digital channels. Part of these higher technology and rewards expenses are related to our expectation of higher levels of activity by our clients. Obviously, we will strive to come in below this, expense, this level of expenses if possible. Managing objectives for 2020 reflect this goal. Our effective tax rate for the quarter was 8%, which includes a previously disclosed benefit of $18 million related to revisions of the amount of exempt income for the years 2015 to 2017. Excluding these adjustments, our effective tax rate would have been 18%. For 2020, we expect the effective tax rate to be within a range of 19 to 21%. Please turn to slide seven. Our capital levels remain strong relative to mainland peers, as well as with respect to well-capitalized regulatory requirements. As Ignacio mentioned at the start of today's call, our announced 2020 capital plan includes three actions. First, an increase in Popular's quarterly common dividend by 33% or 10 cents to 40 cents per share. We expect to implement this increase for our next quarterly dividend in Q2. Secondly, we'll be implementing a common stock repurchase program of up to $500 million. While our recent buyback programs have been executed via ASRs, the detailed implementation plan for this buyback is still under consideration. Finally, on Friday, we announced the redemption of the remaining outstanding balance of Popular's 8.25% Series B preferred stock, as these securities represent high cost liabilities. Our common equity tier one ratio was 17.8%, up from 17.5%, and tangible book value increased in the quarter by $1.69 per share to 55.10. The increase was driven by our quarterly net income, partially offset by lower unrealized gains on investment, and the impact of our common and preferred dividends. Our return on tangible equity was 12.8% in the fourth quarter and 13.4% in 2019. We will continue to pursue our target of maintaining and improving our double-digit return on tangible equity. Please turn to slide eight. We have continued our evaluation and implementation efforts for CISO. Based on our analysis, we estimate that the allowance for loan and lease losses would increase by a range of 320 to 350 million, or 67% to 73% of the existing reserves. This estimated increase, slightly lower than last quarter's, is driven by the Puerto Rico mortgage, credit card, and auto loan portfolios. Based on this estimate, the day one impact of the deduction of CISO would result in a decrease in tangible book value of approximately $2 per share, or 4%. Since popular allowance already exceeds, exceeds 1.25% of loans, the incremental allowance resulting from CISO would be excluded from total capital. In accordance with present regulatory guidance, we plan to phase in the day one effects of CISO on regulatory capital over a three-year period. As such, we estimate the day one impact to result in a reduction of CET and total capital of approximately 25 basis points. After the adoption of CISO, Popular will continue to be well capitalized. As part of the adoption of CISO, the corporation has made the election to break the existing pools of purchased credit impaired or PCI loans previously accounted for under SOP. Under CISO, these loans will be accounted for as individual loans instead of pools of loans. Up to now, PCI loans have been excluded from being reported as non-performing due to the estimation of cash flows at the pool level. Upon transition to the individual loan measurement, these loans will no longer be excluded from non-performing status. 
this change in accounting treatment would have resulted, as of 1231-19, in an increase of $283 million in reported NPLs. This increase is composed of $156 million in loans currently reported over 90 days past due, though not as NPLs, and $125 million in loans that are not delinquent in their payment terms, but would be reported as non-performing due to other credit quality considerations. Again, these adjustments in reported NPLs would be as of December 31, 2019, and could change by the time we report our 331-20 results under CISO. Let me stress that this reporting change does not, in any way, alter or increase the credit risk contained in Popular's loan portfolio. However, the accounting treatment of the loans will result in higher reported NPL levels. The corporation will pursue renegotiations, resolutions, and loan dispositions that may reduce this post CISO reported NPLs further. We are still refining our simulations of the effects of the new CISO models on the provision for 2020. So we are not in a position to provide additional insights and provision at this time. With that, I will turn the call over to Lindy. Thank you, Carlos, and good morning. The credit quality metrics for the corporation continue to show favorable trends. In Puerto Rico, our credit metrics reflected lower non-performing loans, lower MPL inflows, and stable net charge-offs. In the U.S., we reached agreements with the majority of our taxi medallion borrowers, borrowers result, resulting in an increase in net charge-off. Excluding this impact, credit quality metrics in the U.S. remain favorable. We continue to be attentive to the performance of our portfolios and related credit metrics. In terms of our exposure to earthquake areas, approximately 8% of our mortgage and 11% of our consumer loan portfolios pertain to areas declared as major disaster. So far, customer inquiries and requests for modifications have been limited. In terms of our outstanding direct exposure to the Puerto Rico government, municipalities, and other instrumentalities, at year end, the balance was 432 million, a decrease of 26 million when compared to last year. Please turn to slide number nine, to review credit metrics at the end of the year. Non-performing assets decreased by 26 million to 650 million this quarter, driven by a non-performing loan decrease of 30 million, offset in part by, by an audio increase of 4 million. The decline in non-performing loans was mainly driven by improvements in both Puerto Rico and the U.S. In Puerto Rico, NPLs decreased by 22 million, with a 19 million reduction in commercial and a 12 million reduction in mortgage. The decrease in commercial was mostly the result of two commercial loan relationships, while the decrease in mortgage was mostly due to the continued improvement in the portfolio. These reductions were offset in part by higher consumer NPLs of 9 million, mostly related to auto loans. Following the reliable acquisition, we have experienced an increase in early delinquency, NPLs, and net charge off in our auto loan portfolio, mostly driven by the seasoning of the acquired portfolio and higher originations in lower FICO segments. While we are attentive to these trends, we are not overly concerned, as some deterioration was expected following the acquisition of a current portfolio and changes in the origination mix we remain pleased with the result of the acquisition. In the U.S., NPLs decreased by 8 million, mostly due to an NPL construction loan sold during the quarter. At the end of the year, the ratio of NPLs to total loans held in portfolio was 1.9% compared to 2.1% in the third quarter of 2019. The increase in Oreo was mainly in the Puerto Rico mortgage portfolio. Please turn to slide number 10 to discuss NPL inflows. The NPL story is positive, so I'll be brief. Compared to the previous quarter, 
inflows of MPLs, excluding consumer loans, decreased by 23 million, driven by improvements in the Puerto Rico commercial portfolio, as the prior quarter included the impact of certain trouble debt restructured commercial real estate loans. The improvement was offset in part by a slight increase of 5 million in the mortgage portfolio. In the U.S., inflows of MPLs were relatively flat quarter over quarter. Turning to slide number 11, net charge off amounted to 82 million, or an annualized 1.21% of average loans held in portfolio, compared to 68 million, or 97 basis points in the previous quarter. The increase of 14 million from the prior quarter was primarily related to net charge off to our taxi medallion portfolio of 19 million, reflecting agreements reached with the majority of our taxi medallion borrowers. At the end of the year, net of reserve, the current value of this portfolio was 19 million, or approximately 19% of its unpaid principal balance. Of the remaining exposure, 80% is under settlement agreements. Excluding the taxi medallion impact, the corporation net charge off will have improved by 5 million or 4 basis points. Net charge off in Puerto Rico were flat quarter over quarter. The corporation's allowance for loan losses decreased by 35 million from the prior quarter to 478 million, driven by a decrease of 18 million in Puerto Rico, coupled with a decrease of 17 million in the U.S. In Puerto Rico, the decrease was mainly related to a decrease in the commercial qualitative reserves, offset in part by an increase in reserve to the auto loan portfolio. In the U.S., the decrease in the allowance was driven by the previously mentioned charge off to the taxi medallion portfolio. The provision for loan losses increased to 47 million from 37 million in the prior quarter, with an increase of 6 million in Puerto Rico, an increase of 4 million in the U.S. To summarize, Credit quality metrics continue to show favorable trends for the fourth quarter. In Puerto Rico, results were better or stable on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. While in the U.S., we reached settlement agreements with our taxi medallion borrowers impacting charge-off. Excluding this, results for the U.S. were strong. With that, I would like to turn the call over to Ignacio for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Lidio and Carlos for your updates. 2019 was an outstanding year for Popular. We achieved record financial results and accomplished important milestones. The integration of our auto business, the asset purchases in Puerto Rico, and our recently announced planned capital action reflect that strength. We begin 2020 on a solid footing and excited about our prospects for the year. Our Puerto Rico franchise is unrivaled. We've consistently grown our retail and, com and co commercial customer base and now serve 1.8 million customers. However, we do not take our leadership position for granted, and we remain focused on enhancing our customers' experience across all our channels. Our unmatched branch network is enhanced by our innovative digital solutions. Approximately 915,000 of our clients are active online and 80% of these clients use mobile devices to interact with us. In December, 52% of our deposit transactions in Puerto Rico were processed through smart ATMs and mobile devices, a figure that has been growing consistently. The breadth and depth of our retail and commercial product offerings in Puerto Rico allow us to meet the evolving banking needs of our customers. Our operation in the main United States, while more focused, provides diversification to our footprint. We have a strong commercial lending unit that is complemented by two specialized national lending businesses, Condo Association Banking and Healthcare. Our investments in Evertech and BHD Loan contribute to earnings and represent unrecognized value. We are encouraged by our results and remain focused on enhancing shareholder value. We are now ready to answer your questions. 
Well, I'll begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If any time your question has been addressed and you'd like to withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we'll pause momentarily to assemble our roster. First question comes from Alex Tordell, Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, first off, just wanted to uh, drill in a little bit more to Cecil, and I appreciate, Carlos, your commentary on not uh, being in a position to provide guidance on future provisioning at this time, but just with the reserve now approaching 3% and, and losses conceivably being incorporated already in that reserve, is there really a scenario where that reserve does not start to come down in some sort of fashion as 2020 approaches or uh, progresses? Um, I think as we mentioned, mentioned by Carlos, we are not providing guidance on it, but I, I can think two things that you are expected to affect the levels of allowance. One is whether the, the portfolio grows or not. So that's a factor. And then the other, the other is charge off. We expect to have charge off, and there might be slight growth in our portfolio. So uh, everything else being equal, that should lead to uh, a slight growth in, in the allowance. I'm sorry, can you say that again? You said the, the allowance should grow? Everything else being equal, growth in the portfolio and charge offs should lead to additional uh, growth in the allowance, yes. Okay. Um, and then um, uh, switching gears to talk about loan growth a little bit, saw some nice commercial loan growth this quarter. Um, was any of that tied to uh, specific uh, post Hurricane Maria recovery money? Uh, flowing to the island. It, it, this is Ignacio. It's hard to time directly. I mean, some of some of the some of the our construction uh, clients probably have some, but I would say it was not directly tied to the recovery efforts. Again, some of the lines for our our clients to do work uh, were increased, and they used some of those lines. But I would not attribute it primarily to that. I would attribute it primarily just to general economic activity. Okay. Um, and then just a final question for me, as we think about expenses for 2020, the 383 average, does that include profit sharing, or is that something that if you have a pretty good year would wind up increasing expenses again? No, it, 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 it does not include uh, profit sharing because uh, obviously we, we have to, to be a whole set of, uh, of targets uh, to, for the profit sharing to start coming in. Uh, so it does not include any profit sharing efforts. Okay. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you. Next question comes from Gerald Cassidy, RBC. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Carlos, can you share with us, um, if I recall in the past, when you've um, returned the capital to shareholders through the stock repurchase programs, you seem to have been able to kind of do it um, in the beginning, you know, right after the approval in an accelerated fashion. With this $500 million that um, you were approved for this time around, is it going to be spread out more evenly over a 12-month period, or should we expect more of it to be up front? Uh, how are you guys thinking about that? It's a good question. Uh, we, we are in the middle of, of consultations with all our esteemed investment banking uh, 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 coverage teams, uh, uh, so it, we, we, it's not uh, finally decided yet exactly how uh, we're going to do it. Sure. Okay. And then in, uh, another question, you guys seem to have some good success in engaging your customers in the digital transformation. You've given us uh, you know, additional statistics. Can you give us an idea? Are, are half of your customers now in digital, or two thirds, or how much more do you have to go? And then, what kind of benefit, from a cost standpoint, do you possibly see in the horizon, where maybe you need fewer branches or smaller branches, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at our total number of customers, we we we, we cite them as 1.8, and so 915 are active online, which means that they transact at least I think once a month. So uh, more of them are online. Obviously, you know, we we continue to work on digital. We have found that in, in Puerto Rico, our customers uh, 
although they're active online, also appreciate the, 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 the proximity of the branches. We will continue to experiment on our branch size and how we, how we can incorporate digital into the branches, how we can use our smart ATMs and um, also. We just opened up a branch in the Mall of San Juan, which is a sort of a digitally based branch where we don't we don't take uh, we don't process any deposits for any no transactions, no tellers. So you know we'll we'll continue to working on that and what the branch looks like. But again, if you ever been to our branches, you know the number of transactions in our branches are still high. The number of digital transactions have grown exponentially, but the the number of uh, you know uh, of, of of regular Paper transactions have only decreased slightly, so there's not a there's not a correlation between the exponential growth and the digital. So we, we'll have to wait, but we, we're looking at this closely. We're experimenting. If you come to San Juan, you ought to see that branch in Mall San Juan. It's it's really cool. Uh, so. yeah, that that's that's one of the probably one of the interesting differences between uh, our business in Puerto Rico and the business of most of our peers in the mainland. Gerard, as you know, uh, in the mainland, what mostly what banks have seen is a transfer of transactions out of the branch into the digital channel. Uh, as Ignacio mentioned, our branch channel continues to be very, very robust and is really not going down very much, uh, but all the growth is happening on the digital channels. So uh, we, we, are, we are doing more transactions uh, as our, our clients uh, take digital, uh, uh, the, uh, but they, they, are, they do not stop going to the branches when they are digital channel, uh, clients and that might be slightly different than the mainland. Yeah, and interesting enough, even when you ask customers one of the, what is one of the most important uh, elements they look at when they pick a branch, it's still, uh, when they pick a bank, it's still the branch network. Now, one thing you gotta keep in mind is that there's been tremendous consolidation in Puerto Rico over the last 20 years, and the number of branches in Puerto Rico as a whole has, has reduced dramatically. And in Puerto Rico, the number of branches per 100,000 people is still uh, you know, well below the U.S. Very good. You guys obviously talked about um, the success of the Wells Fargo auto portfolio acquisition and the integration into your organization. You mentioned this quarter you purchased a credit card portfolio, $74 million in receivables. Um, two questions. One is, are there potential for more portfolio-like acquisitions that you see in maybe 2020? And then second, you know, is there any interest in building out the density of your New York or Florida franchises with actual whole bank acquisitions? Uh, I think to the first point, we I think we like to characterize ourselves as opportunistic buyers. So, uh, you know, I don't think there's a lot of reliable auto transactions left in Puerto Rico. But we keep, you know, finding and digging, and other institutions are willing to sell. We are optimistic buyers, so we'll we'll keep looking. In terms of the U.S., you know, probably I think we're pretty comfortable with our footprint in the, in in the New York area. Any place we'd be looking for, probably to grow in the South Florida. But uh, you know, we, again, we're opti opportunistic. Uh, we but we're we're not going to do anything that doesn't make uh, economic sense just for doing a transaction. Thank you very much. Again, if you have a question, please press star then one. Our next question comes from Glenn Mana. Keith Brunet in Woods, please go ahead. Hi, good morning, guys. Morning, Glenn. So, um, last Friday's announcement for the redemption of uh, the Series B, was there anything else in your capital plan that had redemption of any other you know, straight preferred or the trust preferreds out there? No, nope. that, that uh, we are uh, our the, the all the components for our capital plan are are now public. So. That was it. Okay, and just to follow up on Alex's question, you know, with an ALL that looks like it's around the three percent range, uh, post Cecil day one, and maybe charge offs going down to seventy five basis points and two percent loan growth. I guess the way the street is kind of thinking about it, assuming the portfolio mix doesn't change. You know, it, it would kind of indicate that the provision, the street's provision for for next year of around 220 to 225, is a reasonable methodology uh, under those parameters. Would you kind of agree with that or not? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we, we've heard, uh, uh, Glenn, we, we've heard a lot of people approaching the, this this uh, different different ways. Uh, uh, probably the most common approach we've heard is the one you just described. So that that sounds reasonable. Uh, uh, unfortunately, under Cecil, the part that this approach uh, cannot, 
incorporate in any way is any change in the input variables to the model. So, uh, you know, I, I, my answer is that, yes, it sounds reasonable, uh, but despite the fact that it's reasonable, it could end up not being accurate uh, because, again, it, it, it is impossible for, 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 uh, for anybody to sort of be able to gauge the input variables into the models of, of each bank reporting. So, yeah, it sounds like the right ballpark, but doesn't mean it's going to give you the right answer. Okay, fair enough. And and then just a, a couple of more on. It looks like BPPR's deposit beta on on average Fed funds movement was around six percent last quarter, and BPNA was eleven percent. We probably have a little remaining deposit repricing. Would you expect the betas to stay in that range uh, in each geography uh, as we kind of get that like stump period of deposit repricing after the rate cuts? I mean, I, our deposit beta, uh, the components of our deposit book are the ones you know well. Uh, then we have a, a a public sector deposit book, which is about 30% of the deposit in Puerto Rico that has a beta of close to one. Uh, we have uh, uh, the rest of our book in Puerto Rico that has a very low beta, and the U.S. book that is sort of for half and half, uh, uh, high beta, low beta. Um, uh, you know, I. If if there is no change in mix, which is always the the, the catch here, uh, then the, the the changes I think um, uh, might be similar for additional change in rates. But it looks like rates are going to be flattish, so I would expect uh, our our deposit cost to to reflect the flattish rates more than anything else. Okay, and the last one on the the cost of borrowings looks like it went up. Uh by 14 basis points quarter over quarter. Um, I know that the three-month LIBOR was down a bit, but what are the dynamics there in, in, on the borrowing side? Yeah, it, it, it's a small component, uh, uh, Glenn. Uh, I, I was actually uh, – I, I can get back to you with, with an answer on that because I have it on top of my head. There's, there isn't a lot of change on the line, uh, and we are speculating that it may just be that some parts of the line that were low cost fell off or matured, and uh, or something like that. So you, you're left with a little bit of the more expensive stuff, or or we may have extended some uh, some pieces of, of that of that line. Uh, again, it, it, it is a small line that did not change much in magnitude, uh, but it, it's a valid question. Uh, I'll owe you an answer on that one. Okay, thank you. Have a great day, guys. Thanks. Great. This concludes our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the conference back over to Mr. Ignacio Alvarez for any closing remarks. Please go ahead. Thank you for joining us today and for your questions. We are pleased with our results and look forward to sharing our results for the first quarter of 2020 in April. Have a great day. Conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.